G'day, welcome to the Noob Spirit Podcast. My name is Isaac Shrek. If this is your first time here, welcome. Welcome to the Noob Spirit Podcast, the home of interviews with spearfishing experts, authorities and characters from around the world. Today we're chatting with Spear Junkies man Chris Dillon, along with the Coatsman and Barrett Harvey from African Spearfishing Diaries. These guys have got... Phew, I don't know, decades of spearfishing knowledge and experience between them. Um, really, really cool guys. And awesome to chat about this project. Um, spearjunkies.com to check it out. It'll be linked up in today's show notes, noobspero.com forward slash spearjunkies. Before we get into this, into this four-way uh, solid chat about the Spear Junkies series, I've got a couple of reviews. Um, Mashamba from the US says, Binge worthy. I recommend this podcast to every skill level. The guests are great and Shrek is amazing. Oh, shucks. Uh, what else we got here? From the US, this is a review for 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing. Teardrop says, The Curtis Creek Manifesto of Spearfishing. Good read from Shrek and Turbo. Turbo. Coming from a fly fishing background, I can say it's the spearfishing equivalent of the Curtis Creek Manifesto. It won't win a Pulitzer. Sorry, Shrek, but it's great fun to read. Awesome pictures. You can reopen any page and read for ages, minutes, and pick up some great tips for spearing. And that was from Adam and SoCal. Also, up in at noobspearer.com, if you get up into the About section, there's a Spearfishing Club Connections section. And I've got a recent edition. We've got a Cat Canadian Spearfishing Clubs directory. Uh, Freedive Alberta, located in Edmonton. You can e email freedivealberta at gmail.com. There's currently two members in this club, but it's a start. So you can reach them through Facebook if you look up uh, Freedive Alberta and get in touch because these guys are keen to start a freediving and spearfishing community there in Alberta. Awesome to have those guys with us. But whatever part of the world you're in, there is a spearfishing club for you, noobspearer.com. Head up into Spearfishing Club Connections and find yourself a spearfishing club. Really fast way to accelerate your spearing. Um, last but not least, a few weeks ago, Spiro Kids, Max and Ben and their dad, Don, were on the new Spiro podcast. If you want to follow along on their adventures, check out Spiro Kids NZ on Facebook. These guys were a cool bunch to have on the podcast. Really love that session. Uh, and that, well, sorry, that interview and, uh, awesome to have them with you. But without further ado, let's hook in and learn all about spearjunkies.com and get in on the latest HD spearfishing documentary getting around. It's an 11, 11 part season one. I really enjoyed this conversation. Let's get into it. This episode of the Noob Spirit Podcast is brought to you by spearfishing.com.au. You might as well check out some gear while you're thinking about spearing and get an idea of what you want to buy later on down the track. Everyone's looking to upgrade something, whether it's your spear gun, your wetsuit, your float. It doesn't matter what it is. Head over to spearfishing.com.au. Fantastic reviews from a whole bunch of people just like you. People that love spearing. If you like, head into the stores. Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney or Perth. There's 70 passionate team members that can give you some help, getting some idea about what to buy next. But uh, the online shopping experience is fantastic too. And if you shop online, for every purchase over $200, if you use the code NoobSpero, you save $20. Thanks for supporting the NoobSpero podcast and shopping with spearfishing.com.au. Equalizing, breath hold, relaxing, taking on depth. There's a ton of struggles every Spero encounters. Every single person that does spearfishing has an obstacle they have something that they're working on they're always trying to get better for me uh, at the moment it's marksmanship it's improving my aim I don't, I don't like wounding fish but if you are looking at the free diving side of things you have either equalizing issues you want to extend your breath hold you have trouble relaxing you don't know how to take on depth these are very common and ted hardy from immersion free diving has put together a whole bunch of offerings for you check it out newspero.com forward slash ted there's a whole bunch of these uh, online courses that can be studied at your own pace from your phone if you like and uh, you can overcome your struggles just check it out newspero.com forward slash ted welcome to the new spirit podcast i've got three return guests today i have got chris dillon the the spear junkies mastermind i've got the coatsman who is notorious all over the world for his uh, guiding and videos and all the rest of it over the years. And I've got Barrett Harvey, African Spearfishing Diaries. It's a pleasure to have all of you gentlemen back on the show to talk about the exciting new release of Spear Junkies. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have you guys. Yeah, yeah good thanks to be for here. having us. Yeah, good to be here. Thanks. 
So, like, let's catch up um, the whole community about the Spear Junkies concept, about where it came from, because some people might have listened to the episodes we recorded quite a while ago now, and a lot's happened since then. Um, season one has just gone live, um, so it's a really cool um, thing we can talk about today. But where did the concept for Spear Junkies come from, and what is it? Mr. Dylan, Maybe I'll jump in there with that. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, um, I'd taken a year's sabbatical um, a few years back off work. I'd been working in the private equity, feeling a bit tired and decided to take a year off and, and just concentrate on a bit of spearfishing. Uh, and then I bumped into Chris Coates as a guide on one of my trips. Uh, we were in Nyaka um, and we were shooting some amazing fish. Chris was filming. And I said to him, well, why don't we make it a TV series? We're going to be doing all these trips together. Why don't we actually um, you know, make a TV series out of this? And uh, uh, that was when the idea was born, really, over a couple of beers around the braai. And uh, we said, yeah, let's just do this. And then the idea was to to get somebody to edit the show and to help with filming. So Chris brought Barrett in. Uh, Barrett was uh, joined the team, and uh, the three of us basically put our heads together and said, okay, well, what is the theme of the show? And we came up with the idea of, chasing 12 uh, fish of a certain weight, special fish uh, in different locations around the world and trying to um, get ticks on the back of our T-shirt. So that was kind of the premise of, of, of Spear Junkies. And uh, we kicked off in 2018 uh, with a couple of trips to Anyaka. And then we basically went to the far, far corners of the earth in search of special fish, which was just an amazing experience. Yeah, right. Okay, so... Um... What were the fish you identified for your list and what were the weights? Can you remember off the top of your head? Uh, I can get most of them off the top of my head. So it's a, a marlin over 80 kilos. It's a sailfish over 30 kilos. Um, it's a doggy over 40 kilos. That's going to, always going to be a hard one. A yellowtail kingfish over 20. Um, Spanish mackerel over 20. Uh, cobia over 20. Or is it cobia 25, Chris? I think that's 20. I can't remember. I think it's 20. A cobia over 20. Uh, Kubera snapper over um, over 25. A rooster fish over 20. A yellowfin tuna or any tuna over 100 kilos. I think that might be 12. I'm not sure. The cob and the wahoo. They are, they are listed on the video. All right, cool. Can you see that? I can shirts? see it. Can the, you see my shirt? The darker salmon. The cob is a is a <laughs> is a cool fish to start off that list with. Yeah. Uh, the dog is dogger. The the yeah, dog that, over the mala, yeah. That's an impressive mm. list to try get. Mala way, over twenty five. Yeah. Yeah. So what inspired the species choice, like the, the species list? Did you just think about what are some of the most sort of the meritorious, the most um you know, the benchmarks of, for those species in, in different places, or how did you sort of come up with your list? Yeah, uh, originally we had a couple of different fish, and then we sort of honed in on, on, on we changed, we originally had a tarpon, I think, on the 20 kilos, and we changed that to a yellowtail kingfish. So we were just trying to be a bit more selective mm. about the types of fish. Um, yeah, it was basically just what fish would we dream of shooting? Uh, and, and what is a weight where you get a benchmark weight that makes this a really special fish? So it was yeah, kind of trial and error until we got to a list that we thought was really an amazing list. So having dived with all the best divers that have guided us and, and dived us around the world, um, we've got MJK in Qatar winning. So he's got nine ticks on the back of his T-shirt. Um, I've got seven, so I managed to get seven. Uh, still got a way to go. But uh, it's a hard list to tick yeah, off. Yeah, I don't yeah. think anyone's got you all You know, if MJK hasn't got them all, Jeep, because he's been sparing a while and he's he's got around the place. So it is a it is a very ambitious list. Uh, right, let's, um, that, yeah, can I say that? I think the trick was to find a weight that was was a good size trophy, but that wasn't going to we get to the end of the series and not have one tick on it either. You know, so it was kind of like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So some people, I think, will look at the list and go, "Well, it's not the ma most massive one in the world, but yeah, we need to to." make some realistic goals so that we could actually get some of the fish in our series. You know what I mean? Whereas still being trophy fish. Uh, also location. Remember those, like a rooster fish, for example, was put there specifically with the idea of actually going to an area where you get rooster fish and actually targeting it as a, as a unique species to that area. 
Mm. Um, so I know some people would go, hey, that's why would you have that as a as a trophy fish on a list? And it's mm. because it's um, location specific. You know, the mm. idea was to go go to Panama, go to Mexico, um, and go and get a fish that's like renowned in that area. You know, go and mm. um, achieve that thing in that place as part of um, how do you say the the appeal of passage. Yeah, but yeah. the rites of passage in, in a in an area is to go and um, experience the fish that that place has, you know. So mm. and to get a good one. So mm -hmm. yeah, like Barrett said, um, obtainable goals that also sort of inspire Strip. the travel and, and 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 experience at the same time. Now talking about that, it, it's pretty interesting because I did notice that you pulled out a couple of um, techniques, Chris, in the episode I watched, the Coatsman. Sorry. Um, where you use very specific techniques for the species that you were targeting. And obviously that's a lot of the fun of spearfishing. It's kind of like geeking out on a species and then planning an approach. You had a couple there, like there was the sailfish where you had those stripped baits at the back. Yeah. That was really cool. I thought that process was cool and it was really planned out. Obviously you've been tuning those over a period of time, eh? <laughs> yeah, that's one of our go-to moves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was cool. Did did you have any angst sharing some of those trade secrets, like in the in the in the series? Yeah, no, not at all. Still got them a bit. <laughs> <laughs> As an editor, uh, it's like Chris uh, Barrett, could you uh, make the show really, really cool, edit it really nice, but show nothing of my of what we do? That would be great. I was like, that's not going to work so well, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, Chris. You all you all you good. Yeah. Oh, your shit's gone. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I can yeah. tell you it's still quite hard to pull it off, even if you know how to do it. So, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's taken a while yeah, for those yeah. guys to get it right. So, yeah. Well, we saw that. Like, um, I think, Chris, you shot one and you you guys got double hookups. The, maybe the second time you landed on that trick. That was pretty cool. And one was over 30 kilo. Is that right? Yeah, that was right. Yeah. That was Potty shot one and yeah. I shot one. So two came in. There was actually a third one. Um, yeah. And they come in hot, eh? they come yeah. in just lit up and dancing yeah. around, but they're not still. So they're actually quite hard to shoot. Um, and, and, and quite often we, we got in the water and they didn't come approach us. They would come and have a look. Who was on the camera? Far away. So Who was on the camera for that main a... shot where you've got, because you've got a shot there where you've got both divers lit up and then you've got both the sailfish coming in and one of them turns on a dime and then the other one sort of scoots off. But he's managed to get it all in the one shot, which is pretty impressive bit of camera work, I, I think. Yeah, I don't know. Who's that? I can't remember. It was one of us. I think it was Chris. One of ah. us. It was Chris filming that. Very cool. I good. like the editing sequence too. And you've got all the perspectives from the divers in the water. There's the storytelling. It's a really dynamic bit of footage to watch. Like, um, I think uh, I think you can't help but be excited and just think, when am I going to get an opportunity to go and try doing that? Like, um, it, it's inspired me to, you know, like, it's just like, wow, what an awesome part of the world as well. Yeah, I mean, that's, that credit's got to go to Barrett, though, because, uh, you know, just seeing how to put all the pieces together, um, the, the all the different POVs, the drone, the... Um, the GoPros with every single guy, that's Barrett's, Barrett takes credit for all of that, you know, and because mm. he has a picture of what he wanted it to, to actually show. Mm. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's, because that's awesome. Yeah, that's before really Barrett awesome. got on, you were talking a lot of smack about him, so it's good to hear you change your tune. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. expect I wouldn't expect anything less. You know? truth. He just yeah. he, he just knows eventually he'll be in the water with me and I'll have a spear gun and so he knows where to stop. You know? I um I'm six episodes in. I set time aside to 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 make an effort to try and get to watch a few before I got on with you guys today and I, I, I kind of got hooked. I um I found myself going down the rabbit hole. I think I'm up to episode seven. So um and so far it's it's bloody it's bloody good watching. So um so Mozambique is a special destination for you guys. Um it's not too far from from your original homeland, I guess. Yeah, I mean that that spot is one of Chris's um Coatsman's um you know go to spots, and he, no one knows it better. And I mean it's 
it, it, you know, you go there and you look at the footage, you know, we've, we've done some filming there before and it looks like it's just wild fish everywhere, but it is a lot mm. of fish there, but there's a lot of traveling. There's a lot of, you know, knowing where to like everywhere, knowing where to go, when to go there mm. with the tides and everything. And I think Chris has been doing trips there for a while. So he's the guru. And I know many people have gone there and not found the thing. So, yeah, mm. we were, we were very fortunate <laughs> to, to have his know-how and also, you know, the setup of the boats, you know, there's good guys with boats there and everything. It makes, you know, all the all difference. Right. I mean, some of those locations we traveled, I don't know, how far is it, Chris, 70 kilometers, 80 kilometers from where we were mm. based to go and get fish. So it mm. was, yeah. you know, it was a, it, it looks all easy sometimes and you cut all the catches together, you know, but it's, uh, it takes a bit of work too, you know. I found some of the um, the species that weren't on the list that you guys shot. Um, like there was the there was a rosy jobfish or a couple of like monster coral trout. They were special fish all on their own and and worthy of a story. Um, can you talk to shooting rosy jobfish, Mister Dylan? I have to call you. <laughs> yeah, no, I've been lucky enough to shoot two, uh, both out in the deep at uh, in Inyaka. So out on deep mm. fifty meter pinnacles. And there's a lot of game fish around, but occasionally you find a school of rosies in there as well. So shooting them quite deep, probably about mm. 25, 28 meters. Um, so it's, uh, they don't tend to come that close to the surface. But you are really good eating. There was a, lot of, so you got an up? There was a lot of banter over those rosies because, right. yeah, uh, who was it that was choosing to shoot other fish apart? Jamie. He got totally crapped on for um, trying to shoot a wahoo instead of a rosy, ro rosy job fish or something. So... That was a bit fun. He was like, what do you mean you shoot that little thing? Like, you shoot that little thing, otherwise you sit on the boat for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you guys were like, the wahoo's not even a tick. What were you thinking? You know, like, uh, I, th I think it was like 20-something kilo and not 30 kilos. <laughs> so I, I got a good chuckle out of that too. Mm. Yeah. Um, what about some of the other special destinations you guys get to? And um, – were there some species that you had on the list that you didn't have a plan for and you had to sort of work out on the fly? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we, we, we really kind of planned our trips before we, well, as we put the list together. So we knew we we're going to go to Panama and in Panama, we're going to get a Kubera and a rooster. That's what we're really looking for there. Ended up getting a amberjack and a tarpon in the Pacific, which you don't get tarpon in the Pacific. I got a massive tarpon. So you can't always, you know, it's, it's nice to have your shopping list, but the fish uh, have a life of their own and they, they, they appear at times when you sometimes don't expect them. So um, I think we pretty much had uh, all of the fish lined up with a specific location. Maybe the one that we didn't have was a 100 kilo tuna, but we already I had a 100 kilo tuna from Ascension Island mm -hmm. when I'd been there a few years before. And I had a 120 kilo southern oh, bluefin wow. tuna from New Zealand. Where we dive with Rob Torelli there, mm. yeah, and Grand Hippie. So I think that was probably the one location that we, or one fish that we didn't have a plan mm. for. You can get them in the Cape. So here where we live in Cape Town, the guys will get them, but over mm -hmm. 100 kilos is quite a stretch. Um, only a few guys have really got that. Um, you get them on, on the rod more, but uh, yeah, no, not mm. so much on the on the. Spare. So with the with the, you had a list. So did you sort of have um a location and a plan for for every species you were like okay we're going to this location these are the four species we're likely to encounter and these are the ways in which we're going to try and attract them or hunt them and find them and so on yeah i think we did so like we chose a destination like qatar because we knew we could dive with mjk there as awesome setup and it would take us out um and there we're looking for a spanish mackerel over 20 kilos mm. and a cobia over 25 so, and he shoots those regularly there, but we went twice oh, wow. and we didn't get fish. So, you know, you sometimes go and you do all the diving and you put the time in and we, we were in an unclear weather that we only got like three or four mm -hmm. days, both times of diving weather. So we're pretty unlucky not to get a, a, a really, and on the boat, the one guy did get a 27 kilo Spanish mackerel, the one day, NASA, one of the guys we we're diving with. So uh, it was, yeah. Uh, again, a destination you wouldn't normally go to, and people don't normally associate that with spear fishing. But it does get really big Spanish mackerel. I think Chris once shot five Spanish mackerel over mm. 25 kilos there in a day. Five over 25. So, 
yeah. If it's on, very it's on. seasonal, I guess. Like, and, and you'd have to say that of king mackerel everywhere, I guess. They um, sometimes at some parts of the year over here in Queensland, we get them solo, big ones, but you don't really get the schools of them. And then other times of the year, you get the school fish, but you don't get really get the big ones. So um, it's a hard one to tune, I guess. Yeah, and they. They, they're all different, um, yeah. they're slightly related too, like in different parts of the world. They don't have as big a range, I think, as some people suspect, like for a pelagic fish. So they're an interesting animal. Um, Coatsman, have you done much re research into king mackerel? Because you've targeted them in several different parts of the world. Um, they're, a, they're a fish that kind of intrigue me. I love eating them and they always want to give me cicatera, but I still like targeting them. Uh, do you have cicatera there? I did the, have um, it. The Spanish Max. I did have it, yeah, two months ago. Through, I, through I, Spanish I, mackerel. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Well, that's that's what I that's what I was pegging it on, and they were the one because I shot three over fifteen kilo, and um, I was eating big portions, and I didn't get like the tingling fingers and stuff, but I got chronic fatigue, like I was having to sleep during the day. It was that bad, and it lasted for about a week, and I uh, really saw joints and really saw muscles, and the only fish I was eating a lot of was Spanish mackerel and I and, yeah, and I'd gone up on a reef reef trip and we had bagged out we sh two of us well we had three on the boat but two of us shot six big fish over 15 kilo and uh, yeah and I was I love eating monster portions smoking it up and yeah I'll eat I'll eat seven or eight hundred grams that, or more. I mean, it's really interesting you, that you say that the Spanish mac could have uh, cicatera. It's normally your barracudas and your your reef dwelling pelagics, you know, like mm. your groupers and stuff like that, that get the SIG. Mm. But yeah, I've kind of looked at um, sort of their behavior, but especially if you look at places like Qatar and how how that works and, and like you always try to figure out why they get so, so big in the area and then look for similar sort of um, things in different other places where they get big. And I mm. think it's just, they like... Um, they like to have a place where it's shallow and warm with dirty water, a lot of or fresh water content for um, for breeding. But in Qatar, obviously, fresh water is a different thing. But there's mm. huge areas of flat water that's very, very warm. And um, just next to Qatar, near um, to the east towards Saudi. And then okay. again on the north of it, just where Bahrain is. And I think those are breeding areas. Because the fish come in to spawn in huge numbers. You know, they come mm. in through from Oman. Sounds like the season starts in Oman and then comes across. Um, and sure, when's it, Barrett? Sort of April. Yeah, April, so end May. of March, April, May. And then even into June, July, um, it gets, it starts getting too hot. You can mm. still get some fish um, mm. if the water's, if you can find cool water. But the water gets so hot, you can't dive. I think a lot of people, what they don't realize too, like talking about king mackerel and stuff and, and a lot of the species on the list is they're all pelagic species. They're all extremely fast growing. They're quite prolific. Most, uh, some of them aren't commercially targeted. Um, and I, I guess that's one of the arguments or sometimes one of the criticisms people like to make on social media is trophy hunters and all the rest of it. But I think, well, all four of us, like like to target those species and it's because they're so sustainable i think and they're fun to shoot yeah i think that's a that's quite a big thing um is the sustainability but it's also i mean there was a lot of thought that went into it so obviously you know we didn't want to pick species that we we're going to have um now you're going to have big arguments over you know you shouldn't be shooting that fish like coral trout for example you picked up that you know we shoot some really good coral trout and it's they fish on their own but in some places in the world it's quite frowned upon you know and mm. also you wanted it to be a list that most people could go and tick off you know four or five and go hey you know i've got four or five of those fish you know mm. um ticked off so more of the common um go-to sort of fish and we knew we were going to get a whole lot of other stuff that wasn't on the list that was mm. probably going to trump what was on the list so This episode of the Noobsphere podcast is brought to you in partnership with Neptonics. Neptonics creates, designs, and manufactures the best gear to land your fish of a lifetime. Visit neptonics.com and use the code NOOB10 to save 10% off store-wide, N-O-O-B-1-0 at neptonics.com. 
partners of the New Sphere Podcast. This episode of the New Sparrow Podcast is brought to you by the world's greatest spearfishing magazine, Spearing Magazine. There are news and reviews for the latest spearfishing equipment and gadgets inside. There's practical how-to and DIY type articles. There's spearing adventures from crazy noobers like you from all over the world. And uh, it's, it's a magazine that you can pick up or you can look at. And if you've got the digital subscription, you can flick through and let it inspire your next spearfishing adventure, even if you're having a dry run. Keep the stoke alive. Check it out at spearingmagazine.com. If you're away from the good old USA, though, check out the international subscription. That's at spearingmagazine.com. The project timeline, like you guys were filming this 2018, it's 2020, the end of back into 2020. Um, like all projects, um, it's fraught with like running over over budget over time. I know at one point in time, uh, Chris, you were talking about trying to get this on Netflix, which seems like a fantastic idea. Like it's a cool concept for a show. Um, has it been frustrating, like um, sort of not being able to find a network home because sort of gone are the days of DVDs and things like that. The media has changed so much and now we've got this free will to YouTube. Um, you know, you've gone the route of self-publishing on spearjunkies.com, which I think is a fantastic route. You're not paying middleman fees and all the rest of it but um nevertheless was yeah was it frustrating journey yeah it was a frustrating journey i actually even went to mip tv which is like the can film festival uh, of tv shows to try and find a distributor um had a lot of good meetings i thought 14 or 15 people i met with some were very keen on the show uh, but when they got back to their offices and they spoke to a few people in their teams they all got a bit scared mm-hmm. by the idea of killing the fish so, you know, that's the problem is not catch and release like fishing. It's uh, you shoot a fish and, and you can't release it. So that, that was a big problem. Um, so we we, we've, we sort of tried for a year or so to get it published through a distributor mm. onto TV channels. And then we just decided, no, let's mm. just do this ourselves online. So we launched spearjunkies.com and uh, you can go and buy, you know, 11 episodes for $10. We it's reckon that's a pretty good deal. Good deal. And they're ten-minute episodes, yeah. So, sort of short, uh, more internet uh, kind of length type mm. viewing uh, times, and uh, yeah, then we'll do season two, which will be the other four four uh, locations. So we we look forward to that. We just got to sell a few of the first lot to yeah, pay yeah. for the second yeah, yeah. lot. <laughs> there's a um, there's a network coming along called My Outdoor TV, and they specialise more in hunting and the outdoors lifestyle. I'm surprised they haven't got more into the spearfishing side of things because there's definitely an opportunity for uh, a premium subscription model for, you know, spearfishing type films because like, you know, you're filming on tens of thousands of dollars equipment, you're spending tens of thousands of dollars on spearfishing equipment and travel and we, we love it, but it's, it's great if like some of the films can generate some income to help pay for it all. Uh, no doubt. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll say yeah. uh, obviously, um, you know, from my side, you know, the, you know, editing the, you know, you know, the the final mix, the paying for the the rights for the music, you know, these are very, very big costs that Chris has put together. And I'd say to your listeners and everyone, like, I think we've produced a quality product and, you know, for $10, you know, guys, please, um, please support Chris and, you know, just go and buy those episodes. And, you know, if you, if you do that and we, we get enough people on board, we can, we can edit the rest of the shows that we filmed already and hopefully do some more. So I would urge guys to please uh, share it with your friends and, you know, support Chris because he's, you know, it's a good thing he's done and helped us, you know, with work and everything, but also manage, you know, it's, I've been filming spearfishing for a long time and it's very rarely that you actually can get some, you know, uh, a guy that'll put a team together and, you know, fun trips and everything and, you know, it's uh, we need to show some support. You know, if we want to see mm. good spearfishing videos going forward, you know, hundred percent. Yeah, I I really like it too. You go to spearjunkies.com and then you get the first episode free, and it's uh it's ten or eleven minutes, and I think it did its job for me. Like it got me on the hook. I was like, you know, sign me up. You know, like ten dollars. Like um. Over the years, I've supported a number a number of these projects, like um, and it's 
it's just a shame we don't have a a, a a dedicated place where people can market and present their films to viewers. We've got YouTube, which is full of ads, and I mean it serves a purpose, but um, it, you know it's it's hard to get a lot of money back out of it. I mean. Uh, Barrett, Barrett knows with uh, African Spearfishing Diaries, which I mean has been growing awesome. And Coatsman, you've got your own channel and you guys have been doing these things for years. It's just, it is hard to generate a significant income out of it. So um, I applaud you guys for your effort with Spear Junkies. It's a fantastic um, concept and really easy to, you know, it really easy value proposition, really. Like, um, anyway, back to the films. I wanted to talk a bit about the cast of Banks. Um, the the sailfish there that you guys like that piece of water looks just amazing. Can you can you give us our audience a little bit of an idea about where Castor Banks is, how to get there, and and what you sort of find there? And Coatsman, take that down. <laughs> okay, um, Castor Banks is a bank that is eighty miles northwest of Nosy B, which is on the northwest coast of madagascar um it's so you you can do a day trip there if you've got a really fast boat it takes about three or four hours um but you know you pretty much have to go out there on a liverboard and that area where the selfish um you see the selfish that's kind of um on the south end of the bank um and it gets like this uh I'm trying to think which way the current comes the current comes sort of from the southeast and you get a lot of really beautiful clean water that comes that runs along this ledge where the selfish mm. are it's um yeah it's a really pretty place mm. and it's is that cold water that pushing up and it's nutrient dense or no um we it, yeah look it is it's a it's a couple of kilometers deep right i mean a few k's away so mm. um Yes, I mean, obviously there is a lot of nutrients and things that come up, but the water's not cold. The water's generally between, I think the coldest we've had, it is probably 23 up to oh, wow. 26, 27 degrees. Yeah. So, so I think I, you, I were wearing like, you were wearing a rash top on it. So I was like, oh, but um, the water just looked looked amazing. It was that electric blue color. It was just so exciting. Like, um, And you guys had the setup sitting there on the back of the boat with the teasers out the back. I just wanted to, I just wanted a part of it. I was just like, that looks really cool, really special. And you shot some special fish there too. And um, and you and obviously you've got some local connections there too, because I think one of the sailfish was donated. And the people that grabbed that fish, they were just stoked. They they looked over uh, the moon. Those guys are actually um, legal fishermen from the island of Comores, uh, Mayotte. Like Mayotte. 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 Yeah. No, Mayotte. It, it, my yacht, and I think it's 120 nautical miles. Wow, it's a good hike in that yeah. little boat. A, yeah, 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 yeah. And they and they go and spend a few days out there. And we've been out there in some rough seas. And you wake up the next morning, you're going like, I would not like to have been. And that was a big boat. I mean, there's guys on smaller boats out there. Um, yeah, yeah. Crazy. They must get they they must get lost at sea all the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you saw the weather on the one episode where we had to like, you know, hunker down and cut, you know, get ready to cut the anchor loose and whatever. And that was not, not a day or two after we had seen those guys. So yeah, they were out there yeah. in those conditions. So mm. yeah, I think about um, episode two, Chris. You shot uh, a marlin on a real gun, and um, that's that 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 bit of action yeah. unfolded over several like it seemed like a long time like there was there was bloody reels getting hooked on and there were guns going everywhere and then eventually the the skipper managed to get a float into you guys and i think he held up a small float first and then you were like no the big one and then uh there was there was a lot of shouting but like it was <laughs> it was cool too cuz you all pulled together and you managed to get the fish which was which was something that, something else yeah, it was really good teamwork by Jamie. So I shot the the, the marlin in, in the tail, mm. actually, quite far back in the fish. It tore off, took my whole reel, took my whole belt reel. Just as Jamie got to me, we clipped on his belt reel onto my belt mm. reel, let my belt reel go, then stripped his whole belt reel. And then we got the float, clipped that onto his belt reel, just as it got. So it was, yeah, it was really exciting. Yeah. One of the most exciting hunts like, I've ever it, had. It, it went five or six kilometers from where you originally shot it too. Like, 
That's a lot of power. Oh, it's a long eh? way. That's a lot of power. I think the guy so, swallowed a lot of salt water. There was a lot of yeah. gurgling and <laughs> going on there. Yeah. It was quite fun to watch. Yeah, yeah. Even while you were talk, trying to talk to the camera, it was pulling you under, and yeah, it was good. Simple, accurate, deadly. Use the code NOOB, N-O-O-B, and save $30 on any spear gun for a limited time only. Go to killshotspearguns.com, check them out for yourself. Handmade in the Florida Keys by Ed Martin. Use the code NOOB, N-O-O-B, or head into the shop and say, Crikey, mate. And apparently Ed will hook you up with a $30 discount on any timber spear gun. Get your hands on one, killshotspearguns.com. So I think I've seen to, I've seen to episode I think six or seven. Um, what what can I expect? Uh, maybe Barrett um, in the next uh, or the the last sort of three or four episodes of, of season one. Well, we've got Madagascar. Uh, which one? Am I? I'm thinking Latham Island. Latham Island. Ah, yeah. so Latham Island's a thing. We did a trip there, um, um, and yeah, it was very good. I think it was. It was quite early. We were going to go September, October. So there was a lot of yellowfin around. We're obviously going there okay. to look for the doggies. And um, as it happens at times, the doggies weren't that full up at that time. But, geez, there was just yellowfin everywhere. And up to, you know, Latham's becoming quite a quite a place for yellowfin and fairly decent size ones early in the season. You know, the guys are shooting mm. some nice ones. But a lot of fun for the filming. And then, obviously, um, we had Mark Jackson, who's a... Um, an old legend South African spear fisherman, and he quickly um, got stuck into some really good fish, big ignoblis. He got the big wahoo, um, and really, really, um, um, him and um, Adrian Krill, who's the other uh, guys involved in spear junkies, he they worked really good together and got some, um, you know, got some nice yellowfin up, and yeah, you know, it was it was fun. It was good times. And then obviously we had the Panamanian import who came with us. Um, and uh, uh, he uh, he did his thing on the side, and then right at the end, he shot a, a really big yellowfin. Probably we reckon 80, 85 kilos, something like Ooh. that. So that was quite interesting. And then um, uh, he uh, asked me to put a second shot, and I shot it uh, with a real gun, with a, a small one point one. And I think uh, it just annoyed the tuna; it didn't really do anything to it. And then when we had it up at the surface, and it had been probably dead for what we thought was dead for, I don't know, three, four, five minutes. And yep. it, the boat came over, the tuna saw the boat and it just disappeared into the depths with everything. Our guns, yeah, our real yeah. gun, and it was never seen. Took the floats down and we never saw it again. <laughs> we lost everything. So yeah, it was some fun stuff. And then obviously, Chris, you shot a, a, a massive marlin there as well, which was quite fun, which we never landed. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't get it on film, but yeah, we didn't land it. Yeah. We fought it for about an hour and a half, um, all of us on the boat. They're yeah, quite a scary moment actually at sea because I'd shot this marlin and the guys had clipped on another two floats. So I had four floats attached to it and I was attached to the floats and it was just steaming towards Zanzibar or steaming towards yeah. Dar es Salaam actually, this fish. It was just going. So the the boat had to go back and get all the other divers and come and you know, bring everyone, right. keep us all together. But I should have actually got on the boat because I saw the boat disappear into the distance and I saw myself disappearing the other direction. <laughs> I was and, beginning and to, to wonder yeah. if they'd ever find me. And not but to forget that later the later they currents back. generally between three and five knots. So it's, it's quite a scary pro, uh, prospect getting lost out there, you know. What do you guys... What do you guys think about the personal locator beacons that are becoming more popular? I think it's just a cost thing. Yeah. I would love to have those on my trip, so as mm. a as a how do you say a safeguard. Contingency. Hey, you lose you lose somebody, I mean, hell, you know. Mm. Um you know, we do everything we can to make sure that everyone's safe, but mm. you know, um shit happens. Mm, mm, mm. And when it does, you know. It's it's interesting. Like I've talked recently with guys about um, the blow up floats. Um, typically, they came from scuba diving where you could put a regulator in and they inflate, but they go up like one point five meters. But you've got these new ones now that self inflate, and you can kind of hold them underwater, so they don't you don't have to hold them out, and they stick up quite a way, and they're bright orange or bright yellow, bright red, whatever's going to work in sort of your part of the world. Have you come across those? 
And would that have been helpful in uh, Chris's situation? You're talking about the... Um, like a safety sausage. Yeah, the safety sausage. Yeah, things. yeah. No. Because they can fold right up and sit in the side pocket of your wetsuit. So just as an extra option if you haven't got a personal locator device. So imagine like you're in some of these remote locations. If you do get seriously separated, your chances of getting found become more and more remote, I guess, um, the further apart or the further away from the boat you are. Yeah, those situations can never happen. Yeah, I was pretty yeah, happy to see the boat man. arrive. I bet you. <laughs> yeah. Even with four floats around you, like you'd be worried about your visibility. And um, with a fish towing you, it's not like um, it's predictable for the skipper in terms of like um, if it's current and wind, you know, they can probably have a good educated guess as to where you're going. But if it's just a fish towing you into the middle of nowhere, like that's a different story altogether. So. Sorry, what you're forgetting is uh, this trip was a boat full of South Africans and uh, the Kenyan leading the thing. We just left Chris and make, let him think a little bit about why he hadn't stoned this fish, you know. We needed to, you know, just get him to collect his thoughts, you know. <laughs> so we left him on purpose, you know. Were you guys out with Eric? Yes. Ah, okay. Well, that makes sense. You're in his neck of the woods, I was going to ask you. But, um, yeah, yeah, cool. Um, what about lessons learned along the way in this project? Um, obviously, we've talked a bit about some of the struggles with bringing it to market in terms of the right platform and the right place and all of that sort of stuff. But what about in terms of project management, um, taking the right equipment, uh, bringing the right people, having the right people there when you get there? Um, what sort of lessons have you learned with regards to that? Chris, Dylan? Well, one of the things I learned was um, on airlines. So when we were flying to Madagascar, they wouldn't allow us to check our spare guns in. They said, no, you're allowed 20 kilograms of luggage, and that's it. The plane's full with cargo. You can't bring your spare guns. So we spent an hour and a half arguing, eventually got our spare guns onto the plane. But you, you want to kind of research those sort of little things to make sure that and, – and sometimes these guys change the rules. Like mm. Chris said, he'd never heard of that before. And suddenly they'd pull that one on us. But you need to think, what, you know, what can go wrong? Because it's nothing worse than arriving in a place with mm -hmm. no spare guns and no dive kit. It happened to me in Principe Island. I went to Sartame in Principe um, with my brother and uh, arrived on Prince, uh, Sartame at 12 o'clock at night, no dive bag, no spare gun bag. And it uh, took them four weeks to find my spare guns. And uh, uh, my dive bag arrived a day or two later. But I... Uh, I, I missed some fish of a lifetime because I just didn't have a good spear gun. I'd borrowed a spear gun from the guy at the lodge, which is a real pop gun. So, so yeah, those kind of things you need to kind of plan ahead and make sure. Uh, I don't know whether you get your gear there beforehand. I've done that in Angola where we sent our gear ahead for the guy driving, and when we arrived there, our gear was already I'm there. Just picturing the, I'm just picturing that, Chris, you arriving at the lodge and meeting the lodge manager and you all despondent and going, I don't have any spear guns and he'll go, oh, I've got a spear gun for you. And then him pulling out this pop gun. I would have loved to see your face at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> that was better than nothing. <laughs> um, so obviously guys can come and find Spear Junkies, the, the film set. They can watch the free one at spearjunkies.com. You guys are still releasing a, a ton of stuff on Spear Junkies on Instagram, Facebook. Um, is there anywhere else people can come and find out about season two and what's sort of um, going to be upcoming for you guys? No, we haven't yeah. really put anything yeah. together. Yeah, I'm just saying we haven't really put Bad anything. You know. a, a lot of the stuff's been logged and captured and some stuff on the timeline, but we kind of just, um, we're waiting you know, to um, go ahead with the editing and stuff, but there's some good stuff to come. So yeah, mm, cool, go cool. and support Chris and you'll see the rest of it. <laughs> yeah and they get to see all the coatsman's secret tricks too like the other one i didn't mention for dog tooth <laughs> that was a cool trick too i didn't i didn't, I never even thought about trying that in a spear fishing perspective you stole some ideas from line fishing it was fantastic yeah. you know, how, how coats coatsman uh, has it any doesn't legs come with... <laughs> yeah, it comes with risks yeah yeah yeah, yeah i saw that yeah i was going to ask you too like um you, you you clearly were quite upset with some of the sharks. At uh, one memorable moment, you were giving a big silver tip the finger, I think. Like, <laughs> there's a fair bit of hate there, I think. <laughs> That's classic, uh, Chris. 
No, because, yeah, I'm not going to, if I say anything, I'm just going to be letting stuff go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, the, problem, the problem was he had spent three weeks before we came training that silver tip and it misbehaved itself. So that's why Chris was so upset, you know, all that effort. Oh, that okay. Into, yeah. Yeah. Is, it, it's, what, is that one big resident at that particular spot? Uh, if memory serves correctly, that spot's called silver tip and yeah. it's one of many. Oh, ah, yeah. <laughs> I enjoyed it when it yeah. um, took a nibble on his fin, and we had to um, resize his. Oh, that fins. was on, yeah, that was on Chris's fin. I remember seeing that. Yeah, that was a bit crazy. Mm. Was that that one you're talking about? Yep. Was no, uh, yeah, it was that one. Mm. Mm. It was one yeah, of those. Crazy. Spots, yeah. Was that was that yeah, some of the most hectic shark action you guys saw, or is there more to come? On the show, definitely. But uh, I mean, if you've been to Tahiti. Barrett will tell you about Tahiti, sharks. There's uh, any, any of the places. Well, we had, crazy. we had quite a, in Tonga, yeah, actually, got, Chris. Any of those tropical places got crazy Chris, we sharks. Had that, we had some yeah. hectic yeah. sharks. What, what, what did you encounter in Tonga? I'm trying to remember the species of shark. Do you remember the one that got between your legs? Chris was trying to bite the, the rainbow runner. Uh, is that what you call it? Is that a Galapagos? I shot a rainbow <laughs> runner. Yeah, yeah uh, Galapagos, I think. And it was hectic. It's a Galapagos, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure. But it nearly bit us. Are they, they are, it's, uh, it's another whaler species, though, is it? The Galapagos? I'm not too sure. Eh? Barrett, what are they? What? Yeah, I, I just know them as Galapagos, but that's the one you get um, in French Polynesia a lot. Uh, uh, yeah. Ascension, the same one as Ascension. Yeah, yeah, those are those. And then Ascension And they're Island, fine. Yeah. They're actually pretty chilled, uh, but they sort of pack. And when they go into feeding frenzy, you just need to not be in the middle. That's the one that one of the sharks put me in the ass with. It was a Gala, Galapagos in French Polynesia. <laughs> that was fun. Just a just a big African hot dog. <laughs> yeah, luckily it but luckily it took my the solid square weight belt in its mouth that couldn't uh, kind of pull out. So that yeah. was that was handy. Yeah. Well, it didn't stop you from having babies, so that's good too. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got a rainbow runner between my legs, that the, Chris. The other really dangerous <laughs> moment, the other really dangerous moment we had was uh, with a sailfish in Madagascar. Um, it's in one of the preview videos, I think, where I, sh I shot it and we were pulling it in and I w went down to do the kill shot and the thing turned and Ooh. came straight for me and it was coming straight at me and I pulled the trigger on the, on the backup gun and the spear just missed the fish, but its bill got caught in the line in the, on the reel, on the shooting line. And then it kind of got all wrangled up and I grabbed the bill and I grabbed the fish. But it was definitely coming at me with some intent to do harm. So you have to be careful out mm. there in the middle of nowhere where, mm. you know, there's uh, uh, selfish definitely attack on second shots if you don't handle them right. Chris has got a theory that you must just pull them as hard as you can and then they're on the back foot and then you grab them. I, I, I think that probably does work because it seems to have worked for him and for all his clients. But if you if you're a little tentative with a fish and it gets some some you know you're like playing it and then it can turn and come for you. You can, and that you can, can be definitely quite see in that experience. sequence where we've got it, um, it because it's held off for a while. You'll see the you see the sailfish swimming around and and actually looking and checking out what's going on, like. Mm. And I've seen a sailfish attack someone else before, and it was the same scenario where it was kind of sitting off and you know guys were just holding it whatever and then sailfish was definitely checking out who what what was going on and yeah it was the same scenario yeah. we had to cut the footage short shortly after because the water went very brown so the visibility wasn't so good anymore for the footage you know mm. <laughs> <laughs> i've heard some funny names for that before i haven't heard it called that so yeah, awesome a brown cloud ah, awesome um yeah well that's that's exciting like i'm going to link everything up we've discussed about today people can come and have a look at the promo if they want at noobspira.com forward slash um spear junkies um for for guys wanting to to sort of do a project like this um though chris uh what advice would you give to someone seriously considering making um a, a longer sort of uh feature length type thing that you've made here like or a series based thing that you've tried to create yeah, do your budgeting first, because <laughs> I think if I'd known how much this thing was going to cost at the beginning, I might have mm -hmm. <laughs> been a bit yeah. more tentative. So yeah. work it out, because it is expensive. You know, each of the trips that you go on is yeah. ten to fifteen thousand dollars. 
Um, but it was a unique experience. I got to take all my best mates from around South Africa and around the world, like Enrique from Panama, Nile. to join us. And uh, it was a, it was just an amazing time. To, to, and uh, you know, for the rest of my life, I'll have that footage to look at. And uh, hopefully, hopefully, the series is a success mm. on the internet, and people buy it, and mm. we can you know, make a season. We well, had a phenomenal team. Awesome. There's amazing footage there. You've gone to some spectacular locations. I even like the narration. Uh, I, I found the you know you've you've put together a really awesome thing here, so I, I'd encourage people to check it out as well at spearjunkies.com. But awesome to catch up with you fellas today and um, and get a bit of a an insight into the sort of the behind the scenes stuff of the of the Spear Junkies film crew. And I'm looking forward to season two whenever it uh, whenever it hits stores and and the the other four episodes I've got to watch in season one yet. So yeah, cool. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having us on the show. What a cool episode with the Spear Junkies crew. Uh, Chris Dillon, Coatsman, the Coatsman, and Barrett Harvey from African Spearfishing Diaries. Those guys are a cool bunch of dudes. And uh, I hope you guys check it out, spearjunkies.com. Season one was just really cool, and I'd encourage you to check it out. You can watch the first episode for free there at spearjunkies.com. Um, last but not least, there is a cool offer. This might be just in time for you for Christmas. You can use the Noob Spiro code now in the Adreno store. So every time you spend over $200 in store or online, use the code NoobSpero to save at 20 bucks. The limit is one per person in store. I'd encourage you to get in and make use of it before Christmas. If you're in the good old USA, check out neptonics.com. You can use the code Noob10 to save 10% off any purchase store-wide. Coming up on Christmas, I'm going to say Merry Christmas. Trick out. <laughs>